Good, good. Okay, who wants to try this one? I can do it. I'm I'm not sure that I have the right answer for this, but who um, had the right? Any answer is correct. Sorry <laughs> <laughs> um, not to get it right, so don't worry uh, about that. That's the last thing I want you to to be concerned about. Um. So we have a shave biopsy here. Um, good. And, um, I guess on scanning, um, I mean, it looks pretty dense. Um, uh, I, I thought I saw some almost like pseudo horn cysts in there. So do you um, think it's an inflammatory or a neoplastic process? Um, I thought more neoplastic. Good, good. Now, at low power, can you tell whether it's benign or malignant, just looking at this? I mean, I think it has well-defined borders. Um, yeah, we're sort of dealing with a shave biopsy, so we really don't know 100% for sure, you know, if this is just a small piece of something bigger. But based on what we have here, assuming this is representative of the whole thing, it looks relatively small. And yeah, I'd say it kind of seems like there's normal epidermis here, maybe a little bit over there. Okay, so so probably if we kind of drew a lot of circle around it, it'd probably be something about like that, I'm going to say. So I, I think you're right. Do you think it's epithelial or non-epithelial? Um, I think it's epithelial. Good. Okay, so benign epithelial. Now, there's obviously a lot of different types of normal epithelium in the skin, right? So which type do you think we're kind of dealing with here? Um, I mean, I, I mean, I thought it might be like... A like an irritated seborrheic keratosis. Okay, what kind of epithelium is, is a seborrheic keratosis? Um, like, like you, you mean from like the... Yeah, which part of the normal skin is a seborrheic keratosis recapitulating? You said there were no cysts. So what what is a little horn pseudocyst? What actually is that? Um, I mean, it's just like uh, from the keratin. Uh, I mean, not from the stratum corneum, but. Uh... Well, it's actually, if you just look at this at real high magnification, it kind of looks like the infundibulum of a hair follicle. Right. So yeah. really, yeah. when you see these little horn pseudocysts, they're little patchless hair follicle openings, mostly from the infundibulum. So. It's thought that a seborrheic keratosis is, is coming from the hair follicle epithelium. So it's kind of follicular in a way. Mm -hmm. Not not 100%, but if you look at this one, this kind of looks a little bit trichelemal over here. Yeah. You've got some squamous eddies over here. Mm -hmm. uh, so you say, hey, you know, kind of maybe this seborrheic keratosis may be from a follicle. Mm -hmm. So I agree. If you just look at this. It looks a lot like a seborrheic keratosis. Mm -hmm. um, now, there were two pieces to this. So that's one lesson to always remember. Don't just focus on one you got to look at the other one. So if it, on the board exam, they might give you a slide that's scanned like this and has two different areas to it. So does this part look the same as the other part? This one looks, uh, this one looks different. It does look different. How so? Um, I think there's more dilated spaces. Um, good, good. There are some dilated spaces. Now, when we see dilated spaces like that, how do you approach that? What, what do you think about when you, when you look at low magnification? Say, hmm, there's some spaces in there. Why do you? What do you do to analyze something that looks like a dilated space? Um, <clears throat> I think it's like classified based on what's in the space. Um, That's good. Yes, you always want to look to see if there's something inside the space. If there's nothing inside it at all, what does that kind of tell you a little bit? Um, I don't know if you think about more like vascular. Um, well, if there's nothing in it, I mean, I mean, if there's really here, there's definitely something in it. But if there's nothing at all, you might say, well, maybe it doesn't really, it didn't really happen inside of the person. You know, it's maybe an artifact. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, there is something in here. Uh, it's kind of got this grayish material like that. And what's another thing that you do to kind of analyze a space? You'll read my mind trick. But... Or, um, like uh, look at what's lining it. Yes, yeah, absolutely. 
You look at what's lining the space. Oh, and is there something like lining this space here? Yeah. Um, I don't know if those are like hobnail almost. Okay. Uh, I think they are. So what do you what do you think when you see hobnail? What does that mean to you when you use the word hobnail like that? Um, uh, like endothelial cells that are almost projecting. Okay, that's one one thing. You can get endothelial cells that have a prominent uh, projection into uh, the lumen. What's another thing that can kind of give you little hobnail like structures like this? Uh, I mean, you can get the the targetoid hobnail hemangioma, but then uh, I think well, that's just, but what's in the differential diagnosis of this hobnail like structure that you're seeing here? Um, I, yeah, I think you can get in the like the targetoid hemosideric um, hemangioma, and then uh, I think also in capacity. But that's that's a type of, of hemangioma, and you, you yeah you can see hobnail endothelial cells here. But what if these aren't even endothelial cells? What else can look like little hobnails with projections of things into the lumen? I can't get a higher magnification than this. But what's another thing that can look like a hobnail endothelial cell, but it actually isn't an endothelial cell? And I see it over here. Actually, if you look here, you can see there's two or three layers of cuboidal cells here. So that'd be kind of funny for endothelial. And these look like ducts here. Okay. So what else can you see where you get projections of cytoplasm kind of at the very tip of a cell that's kind of being pinched off? Is it like apocrine, apocrine glands? Apocrine differentiation, apocrine, good. And this material in here, it's not blood, right? It's some kind of secretion. You look at it, it's actually got some pigment to it. So it's actually got some lipofusion pigment in there. So this is an apocrine area. So there's an apocrine cyst adenoma, a cystic lesion here. It's it's a almost like an apocrine hydrocystoma here, I, I would say probably is the best way to, to actually call it that. It's multi-loculated, multi-lobulated. And so we look at that and we kind of couple it with the lesion that sort of looks a little like a severe keratosis, but it's kind of got some trichomal differentiation. It's probably some kind of a hamartoma where we've got what looks almost kind of like a, a wart or maybe a trichlinal verruca with severe keratosis-like features. And then we've got this apocrine lesion over here. And apocrine and follicular lesions often co-migrate, if you will, because basically if you go back to the embryo, the area that forms the hair follicle and that forms an apocrine gland, same structure, same you know vestigial structure that, that leads to that. So this is a, a hamartoma with both apocrine hydrocystoma features, and then features that are kind of warty and look like a, a severed keratosis. Now, just one final quick kind of question. What's one other entity where you can see apocrine differentiation plus some verrucous epithelial hyperplasia that look kind of like a ward or trichoblastoma, often seen on somebody's scalp and, and a child? Any idea what that entity would be? Yellow, no hair. Is it nevus sebaceous? Yeah, nevus sebaceous. Commonly, and the and the entity that's associated with that is syringocystadenoma papilliferum. That's not what this is, because um, that usually is contiguous with the upper part of the epidermis. You got plasma cells in there. It's it's a not really well defined little um, apocrine hypersystem. But this may be some kind of a you know, if you look at nevus sebaceous, sometimes you'll see all sorts of interesting little hamartomas in there. You'll see trichoblastomas, you'll see things that look like warts. You can sometimes see things that look like this. So it's possible this came from an epidermal nevus. I'm, I'm not sure that it did, but it's possible that that's how that started. Okay, very good. Thanks for, for jumping in on that one. Okay, who wants to give this one a go? I can try it. Good. Um. So... I thought that this was, so this is a shape biopsy. Um, I feel like there was like increased collagen in the dermis and then maybe this like band like infiltrative inflammatory cells kind of spanning the 
um, biopsy and the more superficial dermis. Um, I also just, felt like... Let's back up a touch, though. You know, you said something about feel like. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> um, May Lou, I, I'm going to try to train you not to feel things. I, I'd rather you just kind of look at it sort of like a a, a scientist, a clinician uh, who's totally clinical without any feel. We we might love the slide, but we don't want to we don't want to develop feelings for it. <laughs> okay, so, that sounds good. <laughs> so basically, just approach it sort of from a clinical perspective. So shave biopsy, like you said, um, you think it's inflammatory or neoplastic process. Okay, you, you sort of were sounding like you were thinking it was going to be neoplastic because you said there was some alteration of the collagen bundles. Maybe there was some kind of neoplastic cell of some type or another in there. Um, do you think it's uh, going to be benign or malignant based on what we have here? I'd say benign. Okay, and why? You, you know that you're right. Okay, good. The good news is you're right. If you like to be right, congratulations. We'll give you a gold star for that. But the real question is why? So you have to sort of defend why you think it's benign. So um, I don't see any... I feel like it looks well the circumscribed. There's a low magnification, because obviously we can't talk about cytology here, right? I mean, we might go to high magnification, see all sorts of bizarre mitotic figures and horrible looking things. We change our mind. But at this power, what are the main three things that we think of that make this almost certainly benign? So, yeah, size, if it's like well circumscribed. Yeah, so there are three S's, if you will. Small, small size, well circumscribed. We can we can say this is, the, it starts here, it ends here, it's here, it's here. This is the whole thing. This little, small, little round, little dot there, that, that's the entire ball game. And whenever you see something that's that small, I mean, this is probably a three millimeter biopsy or so. You can imagine this thing clinically looks like a little tiny bump. You know, so it's almost certainly going to be benign based on that small size symmetry. Well, you, know, you draw a line right down the middle of it, fold this side over this side, it looks the same. So those are the three things at low magnification. So you can just say that almost immediately, that it's almost certainly going to be benign. And then we're going to say what kind of differentiation we think it's exhibiting. Um, we saw that last case, it was obviously epithelial. What about this one? Does this look epithelial in the same way? No. No, no, good. So we've, we've got a lot of information just at, at low power. Benign, if it's epithelium, it certainly isn't going to be anything like follicular, sebaceous, squamous, anything like that. It's going to have to be a different type of epithelium, like maybe neuroectoderm or something like that. So we're looking at a benign lesion. Good. So let's go to higher magnification, see if we can figure out what kind of differentiation we're looking at here. Now tell me a little bit more about what you see. So they're blue cells, kind of basophilic looking. Good. And and they're what how are they arranged? I would say they're not nested. They're sort of haphazard. Well, not all of them are nested. There's you know, some of them are kind of almost these little strands and cords. Maybe some of them are, but I agree. I think they're kind of just sort of splayed in the dermis. Um, you know, they're they're not forming these nice, well-defined nests. And then you commented earlier at low power that you saw something going on in the stroma here. Yeah, I'd say like increased collagen or like, yeah. I wouldn't, yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. Yes, the collagen bundles look like they're kind of increased in number. They're a little bit thick. Um, they're almost kind of blending imperceptibly in with these cells over here. Okay, good. And you may not know what this is. And that's okay. You know, we don't really care whether you know the diagnosis right off the bat. The goal is just to learn something. So when you're on a board examination, you have an approach that you're confident and you don't feel like, you know, oh my goodness, and your heart rate goes up to 200 beats a minute. You want to feel like you can approach this. So you, you're you confident, you know, you're going to be able to figure it out. So I don't care whether you know it or not, but I do care that you can identify some of these things that you've talked about here. You've noticed these cells are in little clusters in some areas. Do you notice anything that you said they're small and round? Um, do you notice anything? Is there any melanin in here, per, perhaps, possibly in a few areas? Yes, I see a little yeah. bit. Yeah, a little bit. So what's the diagnosis? 
You may or may, may know it. You may not know it. So I, if um, there's like melanin in the dermis with these like kind of haphazardly to slightly clustered bluish cells, I think something melanocytic. Um, yeah. Okay. So now we can we can make a diagnosis right there. If mm -hmm. it's benign and it's melanocytic, what's the overall general diagnosis? A benign melanocytic nevus. Yes. Good. Excellent. So, so you're 90% of the way there, right there. Now, I don't think the board examination is going to show you this kind of lesion because it's a little bit esoteric, um, but we can learn something from it. So what's going on with this, this collagen here? So we've got a benign nevus, but it's got this thick collagen associated with it. And some of these nevus cells look like they're kind of blending imperceptibly. Maybe they're actually differentiating toward that sort of spindle cell uh, you know, morphology a little bit. So does that ring any bells? It may not, which is okay if it doesn't. It's it. No, it doesn't for me. I'm sorry. This is a subtype of a nevus. It's known as a desmoplastic nevus. Okay, so it's good to know that term, learning it early on in your training. Uh, desmos is the Greek word for tendon. So it basically means that the um, cells look like the cells of a tendon. So if you ever take a look at a tendon, remember back from your basic histology in medical school, it kind of looks like this. So basically what's happening here in this nevus is that it's developing this fibrotic stroma associated with it, and it's called a desmoplastic nevus. So it's just a variant of melanocytic nevus. So you got everything right. You hadn't heard of this before. That's fine. You've learned that nevi can develop this kind of stroma in some cases. And there's one other kind of important entity that you should at least hear about at this point, a desmoplastic melanoma, which can give you a similar kind of stromal-like change, only it's malignant melanoma, it's not a nevus. Those lesions are not small and symmetrical and well-circumscribed. They're diffuse, they're broad. Um, usually by the time you biopsy those, they're, they're you know multiple millimeters thick. So this is not a desmoplastic malignant melanoma, but it's a desmoplastic variant of a nevus. So that's good. Okay. There's an interesting lesion, unusual variant. We don't see those every day. So wanted to get you exposed to that. So, so sometimes, just like the last case, we just wanted to get it into a category and then we learned a little bit more about it. There's certain reaction patterns in the skin that we can look at and classify, but we can't make an absolutely unequivocal diagnosis immediately. We have to have clinical correlation. And Travis has mentioned that in a lot of our conferences already. So there's a limitation as to what we can do. But we can certainly get it down into a small category pretty quickly if we apply our criteria. So who wants to give this one a go? Yeah, I can go again. That's fine. Good. You can go every time if you want to. Okay. Advantage um, of the opportunity, which is, a, you know, you only have one residency. So you better take advantage of every last morsel of training that you have the opportunity to get. Yeah, I, I agree. Once you get um, out like last night at Grand Rounds, that's more real world. You don't have time to learn anymore. You're too busy dealing with all the junk that Dr. Oberman was talking about. <laughs> so, Okay, so this is a punch biopsy. Um, Good. There What's the first, looks... first question we ask ourselves? If it's... um small or large it looks benign or malignant well, that's if you're in the neoplastic silo okay you oh, it's get... inflammatory or neoplastic yeah, good, good so yeah. we're gonna go down so which silo are we gonna go down here inflammatory excellent very very good okay and celebrate even the smallest win at this stage of the game so that's good all right now what do we do next inflammatory so, next step so then we would Start at the top, maybe, and I have to start at the top. I, I actually, you know, I, I, I don't like starting at the top. Uh, people do that, but I, I, I don't know who teaches that. But to me, that's not the best way. I, I like to look at it's inflammatory. Um, what's the pattern of the inflammatory infiltrate? Is it superficial, superficial and deep? Is there any epidermal involvement? If so, what kind of epidermal involvement? Is there interface change? If it's interface change, is it lichen? Is it vacuolar? Um, so that's how I like to do it. And I ask myself, a low power, what kind of cells do we think these are? Do we think they're lymphocytes, histiocytes? Can't really tell for sure. That's how yes. I like it. 
Okay, so I would look at this inflammatory infiltrate, which is superficial, the superficial right. dermis. Okay. And there is some change to the epidermis. It looks like some vacuolar change. Um, very good. Basal Stellar. layer. Stellar. Very, very good. So we're dealing with an interface dermatitis. Right. You've, already, you've already narrowed the diagnostic entities down so much. You know, you've gone from a thick textbook to 10 pages or less now. That's how. So you've really made major advances on the diagnosis just in about 30 seconds. So that's great. So it's vacuolar interface dermatitis. What kind of cells are we looking at here primarily? These look like lymphocytes and lymphocytes. melanophages. Okay. Excellent. Very, very good. Good. So what do you think about when you start thinking of vacuolar interface dermatitis? Because that differential is fairly small. Yeah, so vacuolar things um, with this level of pigment drop out, I think like EDP. Um, I also think... Okay, like, what is uh, EDP? Tell me, tell me what EDP is itself. Is it a disease sui generis? Does everybody agree to that? or? I'm not sure. Um, I know it's erythema dyschromic. Good answer. Good answer. Good answer. No, actually, it's, a, it's kind of somewhat controversial. Some people think it's maybe a late stage form of lichen planus. Um, generally, when we're diagnosing somebody sends something in his EDP, it looks like post-inflammatory pigmentary alteration. And sometimes there is a little bit of residual vacuolar alteration, but in general, EDP is kind of like a reaction. It's an end stage of something that was there before at some point. So, but that's good. That is in the differential. What else do you think about? So um, vacuolar change, I think uh, lupus. Good. Excellent. Which form of lupus? So with pigment like this, I think like DLE, but I don't see follicular okay. plugging. Well, okay. There's actually no follicles to plug in this one specimen, however. But um, generally, DLE usually gives you a superficial and deep infiltrate with lymphocytes, marked thickening of the base of the membrane zone, those changes there too, and thinning of the epidermis. So this wouldn't right. be great for DLE, but it still could be LE. I'd probably say more likely kind of a later like kind of more chronic subacute LE or acute LE that maybe it occurred over and over again, something like that. So that's that's a possibility. This isn't just the first time this person's had this eruption, obviously, with all these melanophages there. But lupus is, is right. But generally, just think of DLE as having more dense infiltrate, thinned epidermis, not this sort of, you know, acanthotic epidermis that we see here. What are a couple of other things? Like a drug reaction. Uh, excellent. So you see you know, eos now, do you have to see eos in a drug eruption? No. No, you don't have to see <laughs> one in a drug eruption. So, so just if you see it, it, it's helpful, but you don't have to have it at all. Okay, and this would obviously be some kind of a kind of a chronic drug eruption in a way. It's got this all these melanophages here. Okay, what else can do this? Are there any other connective tissue diseases other than lupus that can give you this pattern? Yeah, dermatomyositis can. Yeah, yeah, dermatomyositis. A little bit more inflammatory than most of the cases of DM that we see, but yeah, you know, it's hard to tell lupus from dermatomyositis. So that's not, you know, I'm not going to try to stretch your brain too terribly far this morning, but that's a very good differential. And then there's only just a couple of other things. What if I told you this person had a bone marrow transplant? I'm not sure if GVHD causes vascular change. Well, it can. The answer is it, it can. It can give you an interface dermatitis with vacuolar alteration like this. So this is one version of, of graft-versus-host disease. That's actually what this turned out to be in this case. Um, so you can get this pattern. So just remember that you can. You can also get the sclerodermoid form. There's a lichenoid form, looks like lichen planus. So you can get an interface dermatitis like this in graft-versus-host. And they also talk about these little individual you know, keratinocytes. Though, you know, when, when people start saying corones are specific for Grover's or dairy or something, that's doesn't that's not true. It's just basically a, a sign of acanthalytic dyskeratosis. And the same thing is true here. They used to talk about, you know, dyskeratotic keratinocytes with lymphocytes and a satellite lymphocyte. You can forget about all that. that that's just, that doesn't mean anything. It's basically you get individual necrotic keratinocytes in any interface dermatitis that's vacuolar or alteration like this. And this is this just happens to be graft versus host in this case. So that's good. So that's that's very good that you recognize that pattern. Okay, let's do this one. 
And so we're looking at, well, looks like sort of a, I think it's a punch biopsy of this. Well, it's um, actually, it might even be bigger than a punch. Remember, we've got several different techniques. Okay. This is, it could be a, like a maybe a eight or nine millimeter punch, but it's probably more of like an excisional biopsy. Uh -huh. They might All have right. had a biopsy before and they got a diagnosis and let's excise the thing. So this may be an excision. Okay. So this could be an excisional biopsy of this uh, encapsulated uh, looking, maybe a cyst or. Well, let's go back. Sort of it's an inflammatory neoplastic process. Well, this looks neoplastic. Good, neoplastic. Now, capsulated, you got to be careful about that because, you know, what often gets called a capsule is just sort of compressed collagen at the periphery of, of some neoplastic condition. So if it's really, you know, there are hardly any real neoplasms that truly have a, a quote, capsule. Usually that's just some collagen at the periphery. But you're right. It does seem to be a sign that it might be kind of well circumscribed in a way. So I'll I'll go along with that. So neoplasm. Right. Do we think it's benign or malignant? Um. Well, I mean, given that you know it has that rim of collagen going around it, I, I mean, it makes it pretty symmetrical. It's not that yeah, big. It's, I would it's, think it's, it's more benign. benign. If it is malignant, it's certainly yeah. not going to be something like, you know, a DFSP that's going to be, you know, diffusely infiltrative, or it's not going to be something like a Merkel cell or angiosarcoma. You know, it's going to be low grade. So we see basal cells sometimes, a nodular basal cell. That's a quote malignancy, but it never spreads and kills the patient virtually. So, you know, it can still be relatively small and symmetrical, be a low grade malignancy. So if it's malignant, it certainly isn't going to be. A high grade malignancy. Do you think this is epithelial or non epithelial? Uh, I would say non epithelial. Or maybe both. Color. Okay. I guess it's supposed attention. to be both. What about these cells? Do these look like epithelial cells? Uh, I mean, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, they do. They're round, they're cuboidal, they touch one another. What's this structure here? And here, is a, a duct. Yes, a duct. Yeah. Your ducts. So when you see ducts, what do you think about? Adnexal structures. Yeah, glands. You think about a glandular differentiation when there's a duct. You know, gland, you know, gland duct. Then the secretion goes into the duct, which goes to the to the lumen of the or whatever the thing's secreting it into the surface of the skin. If it's a you know sweat gland, so basically you think about. Uh, if you see ducts, you think of a of an adenoma. You think of glandular differentiation. Now, what's all this stuff in the background? It looks like stroma, like mucinous stroma. Yeah, mucin. It's like a sea of mucin. So we've got this massive quantity of mucin here. We've got these little islands of these small cuboidal cells with ductal differentiation in them. Okay, does that ring any bells? May not may not ring any bells yet. By the time you're second or third year, they'll be going off like gangbusters. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure. What do you, it, it's the type the type of cell is producing all that mucin? That's is that the idea? Well, it's actually this. Yeah, they, these cells are producing that mucin. You're exactly right. In fact, you can actually sort of see inside the lumen of these little things. There's the mucin that these cells are producing. So, yeah, it goes along with this. And if you look carefully, there's a mitotic figure. And so this thing is actually malignant, but it's low grade malignancy. You know, this lesion, if it's primary, it tends to be just like a basal cell. It doesn't really tend to spread throughout the body. I mean, very rarely metastasizes most of these patients that have this don't die from it. So this is a, a low grade form of malignancy. But there's not too many entities in dermatopathology where you get lots of mucin and you get epithelial cells accompanying those mucin with ductal differentiation. There's really only about three primarily that are primary in the skin. So you may not know what this is. Does anybody know on the uh, anybody want to help them out that does know possibly? 
Yeah, it's a mucinous carcinoma. Good. This is mucinous carcinoma. Mucinous carcinoma of eccrine glands is the other name for it. They're low, very low-grade lesions, usually seen around the eyelid, often of older women, especially more than men. And they come up as a skin-colored kind of translucent papule. Um, and they're usually thought to be basal cell carcinoma. Somebody shaves it off and boom, then they get the diagnosis. Now, since you were smart enough to answer that question, what's another entity where you can get a lot of mucin and you can get an adnexal morphology with um, sweat gland differentiation also, and the mucin turns into cartilage. It goes con chondroid metaplasia. What's that entity known as? Oh, I'm not sure. Is it like some sort of mixed tumor? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Mixed tumor of the skin, also known as chondroid syringoma. Okay, they don't really look like a syringoma, but basically you get these aggregates of cells. And you don't get the massive quantities of mucin like we see here in that entity. But that's another one where you can see mucin plus um, an adnexal lesion kind of together. And there's one last um, teaching point about this, two, two teaching points about this case. What's something that looks very much almost identical to this? Um, usually a little more cellular, a little less mucin, a little bit more basophilic cells, but it's mucin plus basophilic cells that looks quite similar to this entity. Anybody know what that, that's called? They actually presented this at the Texas Durham the other day. They had one of these. Mucin producing endocrine sweat gland carcinoma. And that lesion will stain positive with neuroendocrine markers with either synaptophysin or INSM1, something like that. They also tend to be low grade. They may metastasize a little bit more, but they're basically the same spectrum of this entity. I'm not sure that they're really and truly different. I think they may be kind of along the same spectrum. And then the only other thing you need to realize is if you see one of these lesions, you need to make 100% sure that it's not a metastasis from an in, internal mucinous carcinoma that spread to the skin secondarily. Um, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of good special stains that tell you that. Um, people try to stain that with you know, things like progesterone markers and things like that, but you can get those that can stain primary nexal carcinomas uh, or primary nexal benign lesions too in a lot of cases. So that doesn't really help you that much. And you really need to work the patient up and make sure that they don't have an internal carcinoma that's spread in the skin. This thing is so small and round and, and does have that um, sort of pseudo capsulated appearance that this almost certainly was a primary lesion. Uh, usually the lesions that metastasize the skin, they're just kind of sitting here like in a puddle sitting in the derma. So I, I would favor this being a primary lesion. Who wants to try this one? I can try. Okay, good. Um... Okay, so this looks like a shape biopsy, possibly of a like dome-shaped looking papule. That's exactly what it looked like. You can just imagine this thing just sitting up there like a little bump on somebody's skin. And this would be a great thing to just take a scalpel and just decapitate it. So absolutely. Um, I think it looks neoplastic. Okay, good. So in the dermis, there's like this... Um, proliferation of cells that um, on higher power to me look sort of endothelial with like all these little slit like openings okay. throughout. Good. Now, if, we were to think it was, if we were to think it was uh, neoplastic, are we going to say benign or malignant? I would say benign. Yeah, almost whenever you see one of these pedunculated lesions like a skin tag or something like that, it's almost always benign. So and we may, again, we look at high magnification, may change our mind, but no, I agree with you. And you're right. When you look at low power and you see these little spaces like that, you say, well, that could be vascular. So we, we think possibly vascular. That's good. It's a good clue. Let's go to higher magnification. And what did you see when we got to higher magnification? So a bunch of eosinophils. Yeah. It's kind of about like a 10, right? <laughs> yeah just like maxed out so um so when i see like vascular like slit like openings and then eosinophils i think of uh, um alhe yeah and there may be some medical students watching this this lecture tell them what alhe means 
Um, so it's angial lymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia. Yeah, I good. That right. <laughs> so the detection, right. Now you you were talking earlier about hobnail endothelial cells, right? Right. Do we see those here. Possibly, there's like yeah, little. We do. Right yeah. there. Normally, endothelial cells are like this. You know, they're a little flat, and you can't even see them hardly. You know, they're, they're that's normal. When they start getting overweight, and they start getting a pot belly like this, if you will, those are the hobnail endothelial cells, and those are are very commonly seen in angiolymphoid hyperplasia the eosinophilia. One other thing that we often see, if we look, kind of scroll around, this one on a scale of one to ten, the eosinophilia is is way off the charts. You know, usually you don't see this many. You'll see more blood vessels. Here you've got the little germinal center that looks like a pseudolymphoma and the blood vessel walls of the cells that uh, of the blood vessels in angiolymphoid hyperplasia usually are kind of thick walled. They're usually thicker than what we see here. Um, so I was kind of looking to find some of those, um, but this is definitely, this is angiolymphoid hyperplasia. Here's another one over here. This one's a really good blood vessel. See this one? This is what you're supposed to see. Look at these hobnail endothelial cells here. See how thick and plump these are and how thick the wall is? That's classic right here for angel lymphoid hyperplasia. You see this blood vessel. So tell us a little bit about angel lymphoid hyperplasia. Is it really a neoplasm? Um, probably not. Yeah, it's controversial. Some people think it may be some kind of a reactive process when you've you know, got all this infl inflammation in there and these blood vessels. Some people think it's almost kind of like a, a hamartomatous process. There are in cases where some patients have a history of trauma and then these things develop. So some people think it may be more of an inflammatory process. I think it's possibly some kind of a combination of, of, uh, of an inflammatory condition and, and, and a vascular proliferation. So that's you know, but it's it's probably not like a traditional neoplasm, like say a regular hangioma, for example. Um, is there any disease that you can see the same kind of histologic change in in angiolymphoid hyperplasia? So there's two What's settings. See this. One setting is just kind of isolated coincidental purplish papules on the ear scalp, most commonly head and neck area, most common locations. But then there's another setting where we can see it. You get large numbers of these all over the body. You may not have heard of the disease yet. You haven't heard of it? That's okay. It's called Kimura's disease, often seen and obviously named after a Japanese uh, investigator. So it's often seen in Asian individuals and often in men. So uh, young men very commonly in that situation. So that, and it can well, histologically look pretty similar, but they get like multiple nodules and in, in all, you know, all, in many different locations, not just the head and neck area. Okay, so one final thing here, it's kind of a good lesson. So you're a morphologist now in part, you've, you've entered the field of dermatology, your number one test that you're doing are skin biopsies, they're not EKGs and blood tests. Based on looking at this, is there any kind of potential therapy you might possibly think might work for somebody with this condition other than shaving it off maybe a laser like a vascular laser maybe but what else think medically um like propranolol like a mangioma treatment yeah, that's a possibility but what about all these eosinophils in here Wouldn't you like to decrease their number? Yeah, so maybe something like anti-inflammatory. Which kind of anti-inflammatory? Something that targets IgE. Okay, which ones? <laughs> um, <laughs> I it's was, just I'm trying to get you to think like, like we think. So I look at the slide and it's got like a neutrophils in it. I said, well, maybe let's try Dapsone on the patient, you know, something like that. So you look at this, so look at all these eosinophils. What about Dupixin or something? Maybe that might work. I'm not sure anybody's ever tried it for this, but it might be interesting. 
you know, what if you gave somebody who had Kimura's disease that had you know 50 lesions and you gave them Dupixin? It, I, we ought to look in the literature and see if anybody's ever tried it for that, because it'd be interesting to see if it worked. It might, you know, I mean, I'd, I think it might work to decrease all these EOs here and see what happens if the blood vessels maybe go down in, in number also. That would kind of go along with the idea of it being kind of a reactive process. I, again, I don't know for sure, but interesting idea to maybe think about. Okay, let's focus on this piece. Okay, great. Um, all right, so we have a punch biopsy. Good, good. Um, it doesn't look very inflammatory. Good. There's almost no inflammation. I totally agree. Right. Um, but hmm. so the alternative is neoplastic, and it doesn't really look neoplastic either. Yeah, it really doesn't look neoplastic. <laughs> now, sometimes. You know, we, we talk about the nine patterns of inflammatory skin disease, and sometimes the main changes are, you know, in the dermis. You know, we talk about um, sclerosing and fibrosing disorders. You know, that's one of the categories. So maybe, I mean, it doesn't look like there's much going on in the epidermis. There's not an inflammatory infiltrate. So maybe the main changes are going to be in, in this area right here. Yeah. It's now, not one of those. Oh, no, so sorry. It's a punch biopsy, right? We agree to that. Yeah, it's not one of those like perfect squares like you'd see like, you know, in sclerodermas. Yeah, it's not a perfect square, but it's kind of boxed off here a little bit, right? Yeah, one on the left is more than the right one. It does look like so, there's a lot of um, like, it's like red blood cells or pigments, like a, a reddish brown pigment on the border. That stuff is just the ink from the laboratory. So this, oh. is, this is what the, they ink the specimen. But so let's just imagine you did a punch biopsy here on somebody. What's missing here? Is it a good punch? Or is this a bad punch? Um, I mean, I've seen better, but I've seen worse uh, too. It's, on a scale of one to 10, this is about a 10. This is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they did a, and this guy was probably somebody that worked out here. You know, they, they must have a pretty strong arm to do a punch biopsy that got this deep. Oh, okay, good. So you take a punch biopsy that deep, what do you expect to see? Uh, you see more fat. Yeah. We don't see any fat here. Zero. So what's that tell us? Tell us this is a, a really, uh, like, deep process like sclerosing or collagen, like. Yeah, yeah, that collagen is markedly, markedly thickened. Yeah. It should, you, should, you should have like, this is probably a normal depth of a punch biopsy right here. And this should all be fat, maybe even almost fascia here. Oh. And we don't have that. We just have a markedly oh, yeah. thickened dermis. I mean, this, you could imagine what this guy's, and it's usually guy that have these, by the way, uh, what his skin must have felt like. What do you think it would have felt like? stiff yeah yes this would have been like really really firm you know you, you grab this between your index finger and you'd be, feel like you're grabbing a baseball or something so really really firm and we've got a higher magnification and there's no sclerosis right we do not see any of that we just see these thick collagen bundles there's a whole lot of them here's the sweat gland sitting in a sea of collagen normally that should be in the fat and then if you look really carefully, and it's subtle, you don't always see it on H&E, and even if you do a, a mucicarmine stain, you might see it. But these are separated, and they're probably separated because there's probably some mucin between these two. You'll have to kind of trust me on that. There's probably mucin between the collagen bundles here. So what disease do you know that you take the thickest biopsy you've ever taken in your life, you're drilling for oil, and you never get into the oil? There's never any fat. You never get there. What disease gives you that? And if you were to do a mucin stain, there would be mucin between these college bundles here. Morphia? Well, that gives you sclerosis. Right? So we don't have sclerosis here. We've got just markedly thickened collagen bundles. The dermis is too thick. It's like it's overgrown. 
stiff skin syndrome? Well, that doesn't give you this markedly thickened collagen. That's also got an abnormal collagen, but not this thick collagen. You may not have heard of the disease yet. Anybody know what this is? Not in this room. <laughs> How about in the other room? With mucin, would it be like a scleral myxedema, something on that spectrum? It's in, you're, it's in that spectrum a little bit, but scleral myxedema gives you a proliferation of fibroblast and histiocytes in that kind of north, south, east, west distribution. It doesn't, you, and it can give you thick collagen because it gets the mucin deposit, but it doesn't really usually give you this massive increase in the collagen itself. So the collagen here is, is there's too much collagen. And these people often have diabetes associated with it. Lipodermatic sclerosis? No, that's, that's a paniculitis. So again, there you're getting the membranous fat necrosis and you get the, you know, the alteration of the fat with some sclerosis down there, but it's not markedly thick in collagen. So this or is scleroedema. Scleroedema. Good. Scleroedema of Bushke. Scleroedema. And basically all that is. So again, you look at what my magnification doesn't have any inflammation and in it doesn't have those you know, cells that are north, south, east, and west, and with the mucin that you can see, it just, it, it's usually a small amount of mucin. But basically, if you look in Fitzpatrick's old textbook, they had a, they show the gross pathology of that. They show actually an incisional biopsy of that. And normal skin is about, you know, yay thick. And, and this skin on the back is about like yay thick. And you can't even really ever get to the fat with a punch biopsy. You know, you it's just so, so thick. And that skin does really feel like, the sole of your boot, if you will. It's really, really markedly thick, uh, leathery skin. And it's often on the back. It kind of is almost a shield-like you know, morphology. It does often give a peau d'orange kind of appearance to it clinically because it's, you know, the, the follicular osteo that are left there kind of get accentuated because of this markedly thickened collagen. So I'm not sure we know exactly how, you know, that forms, what causes it, but it is associated with, with diabetes. So it's kind of an overgrowth of the collagen. It's a little different. It's not sclerosis. And it's and the, most of the thickness is due to the collagen, it's not due to the mucin, uh, like you see with the consclero myxedema. All right, you want to give this one a go? Yeah. So we have a punch biopsy. Oh, it's right here. And um, it's an inflammatory infiltrate. So this is inflammatory. Good. Now, just um, as, a, as a pearl, we've got some fat here. In yeah. this one, see how thin this punch is, and they got yeah. into the fat compared yeah. to that last biopsy. The guy, he took a real thick specimen, or she took a real thick specimen, didn't even get out of the fat. So that just shows you this is kind of normal thickness of the skin. That other was markedly thick. Okay, good. Um, so we have superficial uh, inflammatory infiltrate. Um. And what kind of cells? Uh, lymphocytes. Good. What about in the epidermis? The epidermis. Is that a normal epidermis? No, I see a lot of melanocytes at the uh, basal layer. You think it's a melanocytic neoplasm? Not yet. <laughs> No, I, I th we think it probably is inflammatory, right? Yes, it is inflammatory for sure. So it's not, if there are melanocytes there, that may just be the background normal skin of, of the time. But what about in the epidermis? Is that a normal shape epidermis? No. What's wrong with it? It's a little bit blunted. A little bit acanthotic. I would agree with that. It's got um, a little slight psoriasis from hyperplasia. It doesn't have the marked regular psoriasis yeah. as we see with fully developed psoriasis, for example, but there's a little slight psoriasis from hyperplasia. Okay, what about inside the epidermis? There's some spongiosis. And, a little bit of spongiosis. Good. Uh, a little bit of acanthalysis in that one little spot. Um... 
I think that's really just spongiosis that's beginning to form a microvesicle. Oh, okay. That's sometimes a little bit challenging to determine, but that's that's okay. And what about the cornified layer? Um, it looks very packed. Like it's. Is this normal up here? No. What's some wrong with it? Keratosis. It's got some nucleus. Parakeratosis. Good. Yeah. What shape is the parakeratosis? Mound. Good. They're little small mounds of parakeratosis. Very good. And if, what about the granular cell layer, especially above those little mounds, like this one, for example? I don't really see the granular cells. Good. It's lost. We've got loss of the granular cell layer right beneath these mounds of perikeratosis, this one especially, maybe a little bit over here. Okay. So this is a subtle diagnosis. So what's your differential here? And I don't really care if you get the exact answer here. Uh, that didn't, we're not here to get right answers. We're here to learn things. So. So what's your differential here? Oh, like a good tape psoriasis? Okay, good. Yeah, this actually, that's the right answer this time, believe it or not. This is yeah. super early, super early eruptive gut tape psoriasis. That is what this is, actually. This patient, I believe. Okay. Round of buzz. So this is this is what you see with early, super early gut tape psoriasis. It's got some spongiosis, which is not uncommon. Um you get just slight psoriasis hyperplasia. You get focal areas where you get loss of the granular cell layer. You get this kind of very loose wafer-like uh, perikeratosis. This is what happens when you get a real early, early lesion of guttate psoriasis. So that's good that you got the, the right answer. But what's in the differential diagnosis? What other things would you think about here before you even knew the patient had psoriasis? Or you knew he had strep and then developed this a week later? Um, See, to me, it's just as important that you know what the differential diagnosis is as the right answer. Mm -hmm. So what else gives you superficial perivascular dermatitis with focal areas of spongiosis? What are some other diseases that can do that? Uh, atopic dermatitis. Good. Atopic dermatitis can definitely do that. Absolutely. Um, you don't have to go through the list of 50, but you can come up with three or four. Like an arthropod? Yeah. Uh, it'd be a little funny for a bug bite just to give this pattern. You know, usually that's going to a little deeper infiltrate. So that'd be a little less likely. Well, let's say they had scabies and then they developed a, a patchular eruption. What, what would that be called? If, if they had scabies and, de and um, developed this reaction? Yeah, would... unless you treated them with, with quell and then they got a, like a papular eruption that developed after treatment and it showed this histologic pattern. What's that called? Like um, what are the five main spongiotic dermatitides that we talk about? The ones that that's like a ma mantra that you should dream about in your sleep. What's the other one? Listen to the song and they were. Um, well, drug eruption is always right, but yes, this could be a drug eruption, but that's not the classic five that we think about. Could it be like an allergic contact? Yeah, contact dermatitis could possibly be that, a subtle contact dermatitis. Nubular dermatitis gives you spongiotic dermatitis like this. Mm -hmm. Dishydrotic dermatitis, palms your soul. Contact nebular dishydrotic id reaction. Those are the four main things that, that can always you think about here when you see this. And then things like pityriasis rosea, viral exanthem. Uh, you mentioned drug eruption. 
So those are some other things that could theoretically give you this pattern. Psoriasis can give you this. We just saw that here. Early, super, very, very early erythromultiforme can look like this. Um, so those are some of the things that, and, and a, a psoriasis form dermatitis that develops following patients taking biologics can look like this. Sometimes get some eosinophils here. So this is just super early guttate eruptive psoriasis, probably day one. Somebody's got it. Okay. All right, any questions? Okay, well, let's stop there and we will do this again in the future. Thank you. Bye.